All right, I'm going to start off with a, a couple of caveats. <laughs> That's like it. So, yeah, we're not at a stage where I can really do like an in-depth scientific review of these things. So really, I've turned up to show that what we know so far, uh, we're, we're four and a half years into trying these things out in the, in the UK. Spain was a little bit ahead of us, but we still haven't really got enough to do well, from my opinion, like a, a robust safety analysis. I want to show the best of what we are. So when you look at the paper, it's like a half, this is kind of what we know, and half like a, a sort of guide to engineers who are actually considering putting these things on the ground, really. I'm not going to talk too much about that because I've got uh, 20 minutes, but a lot of it is like, a, well, don't do that there and try this here and, and trying to get people up to speed with where we are because uh, we've certainly learned a lot of lessons off them. And the, uh, the other caveat I'll give is, is the name. I thought I'd spend a couple of minutes just saying why we call it light segregation in the UK rather than like the kind of more international term for the Americans of like protected bike lanes, all the rest of it. Protected bike lanes, as far as I'm concerned, considers anything you do to protect a cyclist in there. Um, whereas light segregation is called light because it's a lighter touch. It's not like an L-I-T-E, like my boss wanted to be, and it's not soft, and it's not semi, and I'm going to attempt over the next uh, 20 minutes to show you why I think it's actually better than full segregation and that it's more adaptable. And the, the big thing about light segregation, using this lighter touch, well, it's adaptable, but like uh, I designed it specifically to unite both schools of cycling now. Uh, anywhere, particularly if you haven't got a fully established cycling culture like uh, some of the northern European cities, you very much have two camps of cycling here. Segregationists who want like a curb segregation everywhere, affectionately known in the UK as the curb nerds. I don't know whether you have that term in there. But they want segregation going from their bedroom to wherever they happen to go that day. You've got that school of thought and then you've got the complete opposite, the kind of vehicular cyclists. The, I'm, I drive on the road like a car and I don't want anything that's going to take me out of my primary kind of driving position in there. So like a, for, I've been doing cycling for about 15 years and pretty much anything I did or anything I put on the ground was either attacked by one camp or the other. And I thought there has to be a way of making cyclists happy with something I build in my life. So but pretty much light segregation was an attempt to do that in that it like a, sort of protects you if you're in a secondary position, you're near the curb but it enables a primary position because the, the catchphrase that we used at the time was protect, don't trap. Now, if you're in like a full segregation, you're pretty much trapped in that near side position. And uh, you know, in places like a demo, you, you kind of have to stay in that position. That's good. That's their approach. But I'd never really be able to trap a British person anywhere. They're going to want to use the full right of the road. And, and who would stop them, particularly like over uh, the discussions yesterday about speed pedelecs, they're going to want to go out and go fast. But then sometimes if there's lots of traffic and turning movements, they might quite like to pull near side to have a bit of protection. There. So it gives people that choice. And that's why I think it's kind of, it's better than full segregation. It's certainly more adaptable and cheaper. But that's my, that's why it's light. It's a lighter touch. It's not a halfway house. For me, it's more adaptable as we get in there. So, all right, that's my, they're my two caveats. Let's get on to the actual research now then. Okay, I'm starting off with uh, uh, one in Spain there, because really like the, uh, the three countries that have really got into this uh, are Spain, the UK, and America as well to some extent. So certainly when I first started putting them on the ground in the UK, I was importing Spanish products to do that. And that was like the, the first sort of mainstream product there, which you can see on there, the armadillos as we call them in the UK because they were called zebras because the company Zickler in Barcelona that make them and now all their products have to begin with a with a Z but we said we had zebras in the UK so we we did a little bit of a, a Twitter online debate and came up with the with the word armadillo <laughs> anyway very popular okay let's get into it so what's the history of it actually like all things like all ideas it's not actually particularly new just it's really been cotton on, particularly when the uh, when the Americans got into it in the in the Nactel guidance uh, from New York, people went, oh yeah, that's what it is, and they certainly marketed it a lot better than it had been. But that uh, picture on the right there shows uh, the 2005 London Cycling Design Standards, and it's actually got something that you'd pretty much refer to as light segregation. There's something on the cycle lane protecting it and and discouraging cars from incurring into that space. In this case, the use of hedgehogs. There'll be lots of animal names as I go through this, and I'll, I'll leave it to yourself in some cases to go on. But I, I noticed that Paris had uh, plenty of hedgehogs as I was wandering around last night. So they're, they're basically preformed concrete lozenge looking things. Half baguettes if you want a more French. Anybody seen a hedgehog? Anyway, that's your homework to look out for hedgehogs. I did take a picture, but I didn't have time to put it into the slides. Anyway, you've always been able to put stuff on cycle lanes. 
Uh, and if it's inside a cycle lane, then a, a car shouldn't be crossing that if it's a mandatory cycle lane in there. So you effectively, you effectively are protecting that lane and discouraging cars from moving into it. And that's, and that's really the main thing. Um, when you do do cycle lanes, and there's a lot of talk about the power of cycle lanes, is that infrastructure. We don't even really classify cycle lanes as infrastructure in London anymore because they've just not been effective. They're not particularly effective at getting new people cycling. When they do go in them, they're in what you'd regard as like the worst, most dangerous position in the road to be in, hugging the curb. No sight lines when you get to like uh, the side roads. Everybody who trains you to cycle will tell you to ignore all cycle lanes. Stay in the middle of the lane, position yourself out when you're going past the side road. So we've got something that contradicts all cycle training. So our number one form of infrastructure doesn't work for cyclists. That's, that's something to think about. Unless you protect it, unless you can guarantee that that space is always yours, someone's not going to park or load in it, cross it, routinely pop in and out to undertake, overtake, all, all these things happen with it. So. Pretty much we'd, uh, we'd given up on cycle lanes <laughs> until we found like this way of kind of protecting it. And that, that scheme on the right there was the first, uh, the first light segregation scheme I did in, uh, in Camden. And I'll just talk you through that for a moment really. Um, that scheme there, uh, four years ago, was actually a two-way track, a fully segregated two-way track. But we had like, a, as most people know, they've done two-way tracks, lots of collisions at side roads because you, you've got cyclists no way coming that way in an unexpected side of the road and drivers don't particularly look out for them. So we had whole spates of them. Uh, very much uh, at the turn of millennium in Camden, we were trying to be the new Amsterdam. That was our kind of motto in there. But yeah, whenever you try to do something in Amsterdam, it always gets like constrained and anybody trying to put anything new for cycling in there will know you're going to be pushed down to the absolute minimum whips of everything. So we were putting a lot of two and a half metre wide two-way tracks in, which... Uh, yeah, eeky, but that's getting two and a half metres out of the road space in the UK at the time was like a, a landmark kind of moment in there. I remember when we shifted from 1.2 metre wide lanes to 1.5 and, and we were all high-fiving that we dared to take so much space from the road, there, even if it was like just in an advisory way. But I digress. Anyway, the, the first uh, scheme there, we, we used planters and uh, just like uh, to call out, it's very much inspired the use of planters from Vancouver and it has been a... Interesting one, they used the kind of solid planters and I knew um, I wanted to put something in a cycle lane or well, you'll see from that picture that there isn't actually a cycle lane there. It's just objects placed in the carriageway. We did change that eventually, although I, I still I still swear by this side. I was like, yeah, this is a cycle infrastructure that isn't a cycling infrastructure was my like a philosophical approach to it. It's just objects placed in the carriageway to suggest people go in certain areas. But there was nothing stopping a motorcyclist going in there, nothing stopping someone parking, apart from the fact that there was objects placing you there, blocking you from going in there. And we subsequently changed that, albeit, you know, I'm still a little bit bitter about that. So we just use it to protect cycle lanes, and that's definitely the guidance we got in there. Anyway, I used the planters because it was something that I could put on the, on the carriageway, and it was visible and large enough that, albeit it was, although it was an obstruction in the highway, it was something that people had used before. But all the, uh, all the debate really came about the use of the, uh, the armadillos and the, and the Spanish one. I'll, and I'll just share with you <laughs> some of that process in there. The Department for Transport, when I went to them, said, I want to use the, the Spanish products, uh, um, zebras, armadillos on the street. They just went, no way. You can't place objects in the highway. They're, they're too small. They're too, too visible in it. But oh, this is an international phenomenon. They just hit whatever. No. So anyway, uh, not being a man to take no for an answer, I went to like uh, the transport minister, I said, I want to do this. And he was quite into cycling. Uh, Norman Baker at the time said, I'll support you. So then it was a case of lawyering up, um, going through all the, the local authority lawyers and going, I'm going to put this new product on, on the UK streets and see what happens with it. So I'm going to talk you through kind of what happened with it. But it did cause quite a, quite a furore. It was on the, on the national news, which is quite interesting. It was the first bit of infrastructure had done that, that launch of its own news show and then people go oh, is it just a one-off is it a flu is it like a freaky thing um i certainly thought there'd be a lot more than the schemes we have now when i when i put this one in there mm. anyway let's get into it oh yeah it's this one okay so what is it what is it i probably should have started off with that one but i thought i'd do a longer uh, meandering intro so we say the use of physical objects intermittently placed alongside a cycle lane marking uh, to give additional protection. So you're basically putting something on a cycle lane to stop cars crossing it. That's really what it is. But it's that use of the word intermittent that I think defines light segregation as opposed to protected bike lanes and some of the stuff. It's not a continuous strip that like, a, particularly if you're doing like a narrow segregation, which people are 
trying to put it in there will tend to do there. So if you do it in the Dutch style, if you've got a narrow strip, how do you keep it clean? It's just going to collect all the rubbish and debris and not particularly work there. So if you can go full wide and then you can get like a full street cleaner down it, great. If you can get two and a half metres in there, oh yeah, I'm at 10 minutes already. God, yeah, that was just my intro done. Okay, um, sorry, yeah, so yeah, something intermittently that protect on trap. And there's an example there of just something placed on a cyclone in there. I better quickly get to some evidence. So what are, what are the benefits? It does, it guarantees that you get that kind of space and all the evidence when I go through it in a minute will show that uh, the rate of incursion into these things is pretty low. Particularly on one like that where you use the kind of visible, uh, the vertical poles, the flexible poles there. Cars aren't really gonna cross that. They'll know they're doing something wrong when they bend a pole back and it flops back towards them. It's a pretty clear indication that that's a part of the carriageway that it shouldn't be in. We certainly know with cyclones on their own in the UK that they're not really getting that message. Sometimes when we use like a blue or green inside it, they might think it's okay, but most people think cyclones are there if they have to, but they can get into them anyway, and nobody really understands the rules and they're probably gonna park in them. Anyway, all that sort of stuff. So the benefits are that you guarantee some kind of space and it seems to be enough of an enticement, and I use that word a lot, to get people to actually consider cycling. It's just the right amount of protection for people actually to give it a go. But then, like I say, it doesn't offend the people that wanna go out and use the carriage where there's nothing stopping people popping in and out of these things. Um, the, the other ginormous benefit of these things is remarkably cheap. If you're doing like a, a Danish style step track in the UK, you're looking at least like 850,000 euros like a, per kilometer. That's like a, a really low amount as well. That's like the lowest you could possibly get it in. Full um, Dutch style segregated curb track, you're looking like 650, 750 like a kilometer in there. So it's not just putting that in, you have to reprofile the carriageway, change all your gully positions, move all your street light. And it's an expensive job putting these things in. These, like a, 40 euros a unit you can do it DIY yourself in an afternoon and some people have done that in the UK it's it's roughly like even with all the planning process and going through the designs working out about 50,000 K uh, per kilometer which is like a different order of magnitude or that so that's its bigger benefit it's cheap and it's flexible and it doesn't annoy all your cyclists isn't that good doing it everywhere. Um, so yeah, it vastly improves the uh, level of service for cyclists and other and one. So that, that would be, without the uh, light segregation and uh, a fairly poor bit of kit, probably an invitation to like roll over and park on for, for most vehicles in there. But it's something that kind of maintains that two-way track, albeit not best standards, it's certainly upgraded it. And that's the one thing. Lots of people have got lots of cycle lanes out there, but they're not effective. They're not gonna get you people who are actively considering cycling, cycling, because you don't feel safe in there. Run along, put some of these things on whatever you have built, instantly the level of service uh, greatly rises. All right, I'd better start speeding up a little bit. Value for money, I talked about that one. Uh, this is one of the first ones I did as well, the so-called floating parking, using cars as portable segregation devices, as uh, I was calling them at the time there. Float them away from the curb, and then you're completely protected from traffic by cars. And it was like on day one, would they line up with that? Would they not? Would they still want to get to the curb? Pretty much cars just got it straight away that they weren't supposed to go over that one, and they were supposed to park in the bays away from it. And this is the thing when you test new stuff, you go, oh, well, it might have worked there. Would it work in the UK? It did, and it has done ever since. And the adaptability, you can change stuff in there. That first scheme I did uh, proved quite popular. And within like uh, six weeks, we went and uh, pulled some of them out and moved them out half a meter because we needed extra capacity in there. When you hardwire stuff in with full segregation, you're stuck. Like, sorry, that cost us millions. You're having that for the next 20 years. But there's huge amounts of cyclists in there. And I did like one of those 2.5 meter wide ones I did in Camden, I put in in 2002, where there was four cyclists a day. It was so enticing that we went to four cyclists a second within three months and then had capacity issues for 15 years on that one. Subsequently ripped the whole thing out or actually changed it to one way and put light segregation on the other side. So it gives you that adaptability to respond. What if they do actually come? Even if I'd predicted a 400% increase, I would have had plenty of space for it. It wasn't, it was like 20,000% increase in three months. What do you do? Segregation is popular. Okay. Oh, the legality of it. Um, yeah, just 
we're very keen on, on legal systems. And like I say, if you place something in the UK on the highway, you make an obstruction in there, and you do that as your own risk as a highway authority. So as long as you think you're covered, you can place something in there. So what I did to get this on the ground was do a full sort of risk log, all the mitigation to do with various aspects went wrong, got it signed off by the lawyers and said, this, this is what it is. So when other people are doing it in the UK, I talked them through that process, and they have to get it signed off by their own lawyers. Good stuff. That's the kind of legal stuff. Of course you can do it. Um, research, let's get into it. Let's get into some of the research because that's what it's all about. This is one of the first bits, uh, major bits of research. We did an international best practice one. I'm seeing what other people did that we didn't do in the UK. And one of the things was like uh, light segregation. We went over to Seville, saw a few places in there. And one of the findings was that the low level separators were considered more successful, mainly because uh, the vertical ones had quite an impact on the, uh, on the character of an area. I mean, they're pretty ugly. Most of these things aren't aesthetically great, <laughs> but it will get you there. We're kind of working on that one. But the key one was like Seville, and we just had our transport minister, Jesse Norman, over in Seville, and I hope they told him this when he was there. He managed to get 80 kilometres of segregated networking in four years, just like banging it out. That, that kind of level of delivery means, because we've had uh, Dutch people come over to the UK in the past and go, right, you need a 40-year commitment, and then our MPs go, whatever. What can I do in four years? That's what I want to know, what the term is of a political cycle in there. So I'm four years, I can do 80 kilometres of segregation, man. Okay, keep talking. You know, that's that kind of a situation in there. Okay, another one about uh, Royal College Street, that first one that I put in there. So this is the kind of first uh, safety one. That numbers rose 70% from the first year, and then there's the collisions for 15 months before and the 15 months after. It was like a, a, a real, like, accent black spot at the, at the side roads in there. So we went from having... Uh, what does it say there? 18 collisions before and uh, three in the 15 months after. So I made segregation safe. And that was one of the big things. Most of the segregation we had in London was associated with like a, a large number of collisions. That one that I talked about with the cyclists every four seconds, that was on the evening standard as the most dangerous place to cycle in London. That was put in there because you looked at the amount of collisions that were happening there because there were so many cyclists in there. People go, well, this is dangerous. I had to prove that segregation was safe to bring it back to make a case for it because in the light of doing this, all the, all the policy at the time was like no segregation. It's just not safe. People don't want to be in that position. Cyclists don't like it anyway. So as a, as a fan of segregation and knowing that it actually entices people to cycle, I needed to prove that it was safe. There's the proof. Okay, so we looked at, we did some research with the Transport Research Laboratory. They kind of put people behind different types of segregation and said, well, what do you think about that? And then, yeah, clearly cyclists went, yeah, I want the full segregation. I feel more protected in that. But they also did feel protected from the light segregation in there. And there was little objective safety difference from light and full segregation. So in terms of actual safety to the person, it seems to be quite the same. That's, that's what that research document gets in, into. Okay, read it at your leisure. And another one, like uh, looking at this, uh, New Zealand, I probably could have mentioned is another place that, that pushed uh, a lot of light segregation in there. And this is one of the first ones, uh, I quote this figure a lot, albeit there's a few different sites, and I should say not all of them paint as rosy a picture as this stat. <laughs> Um, but like uh, just going in there, when you put like a little Wiley curves, which are kind of low level like dimples like that, they had a little bit of incursion over. When you put posts alongside it in combination, it went down from like a, talking 65% of vehicles overran the cycle lane. That's pretty much the UK picture as well. Put these things on, it went down to 0.1%. It was just one nutter all day that just wasn't going to have it. And, you know, you can't really design those out there. So it's looking pretty pretty good there just from the other side like uh, on surveys and things from uh, from america uh, saying 85 percent of residents were more likely to cycle if these things were in place that's pretty good to go to your policy like uh, if you've got a policy of making more people cycle and you've got something everybody says they want they want then maybe you should go ahead and do it ah, good stats okay and this is a a new bit of research that we're hoping will come out soon from a uh, Transport for London in there, and it pretty much backs up a lot of what I said that it's it's quite successful in there. We, we were debating at the time. I was at Transport for London at the time. What kind of level of research should we do? Should we get into it and do like a a completely scientific based one? But I, I was advising at the time we didn't have enough examples of it. So really, what was the state of the art? What were people doing? What had gone wrong and what had gone right? And that's what I'll uh, get into now. So the issues, you know, planters are great, but they do get bashed around. We didn't go with the full Vancouver one, and really it was like a, it was a passive safety decision that I made, really, that I wanted a, because it was such an excellent black spot, Royal College Street, I used planters that were quite thin and fabricated, so if a car hit them, they were full of soil, they bounced off a base plate and they crumpled 
so I didn't have it. I wanted to take out all the collisions on the street there. But then car driver, for some unbelievable reason, just kept on dinking into these things. And then they were costing like 600, 700 euros to replace each time. And like uh, the maintenance teams weren't particularly happy with these ones. Maybe I could have spec'd out one that was slightly thicker that bounced off the base plate, but you could strap it and put it back in there. Having it crumple as well was maybe a bit belt and braces, I would say, in there. But let's get into some more issues. The big issues really about light segregation that we've got to talk about uh, are the effect on other modes, like particularly pedestrians are, are the most worried. They're not the ones that have made the most noise, that's motorcyclists, uh, but pedestrians are, are the kind of biggest issues. The, the fact that they might be anticipating some small objects in the carriageway, and it's the trip hazard potential of it. And certainly there was one uh, instance in London where people use very low level ones, very small ones, but enough to trip you, and nothing vertical in the area. And on advisory cycle lanes as well, at a really busy crossing next to a station, it was like all the things that we say, well, maybe you shouldn't be using light segregation there. But he did have a whole series of trips there. They kind of gave the, uh, uh, the objects a little bit of a bad name. So context is everything like when it comes to design in there. So really think, well, if there are a lot of like uh, uncontrolled crossing movements in there, maybe go for different spaces, maybe go for something a bit more vertical in there. So that's what a lot of the paper's about. What kind of choice of product would you use and what kind of combinations in what context? But okay. All right, that's like a list of all the... Uh, well, not all of them. Most of the products we kind of know of, and they're like a pluses and minus, but I want to very quickly get to an actual case study in there because I know I haven't got much time left there. So th this is what we consider to be best practice. This is the scheme in Enfield in, in North London. And the best practice we'll say here is the combination of different approaches in there. So one, if you're starting with one of these things, start with something vertical. Particularly on motorcyclists say, how can we see these things when we're like maneuvering in there? You start a run with something vertical in there, they shouldn't be crossing a solid white line anyway, but at least you've given that indication in there. So it's like, hey, look, something's about to start there. And then intermittent objects placed along the, the cycle lane in there. But you can see in this one, we've got like a combination of smaller and larger objects. Now, the smaller ones are where there's crossovers, so traffic. Um, cars will be crossing over the lane to get into properties in there. So we devised a kind of smaller one. Now there's so many crossovers along this road that if we just left it, you'd get like 150 metre stretches with nothing and then you'd lose that enticement factor. So by using the combinations of large and small, we can maintain some kind of consistent intermittent object along there. So we consider Enfield to be uh, one of the best examples of it, albeit it's not quite finished yet, so we'll see in the next three years how it stacks up in terms of like uh, cycling. But just by putting these things in, uh, Enfield's one of the places where there's hardly any cyclists whatsoever. It's less than 1% kind of mode share. It's really, um, we had a project called the Mini Holland Project about trying to like uh, promote cycling there. This is one of the main effort. Yeah, I'm up. Okay, I'll just talk. I was going to talk about um, bus stop treatments, but... It's quite, a, it's quite a topic to get into. But you can see on like a, the Enfield one, it went for a kind of Danish, Danish sort of shared bus border where pedestrians <coughs> step across the cycle lane, as it were, to get onto buses and cyclists have to kind of yield or go around, get through there. It certainly saves on time rather than doing like a, a full bus stop bypass, which would have divided it in there. I could talk about that all day. All right, that's probably enough for me. There's me looking a bit healthier <laughs> than I am today. <laughs> okay.